Um, I know I'm not sure if you guys heard this or not, but uh, Reverend Billy Graham, who's a pastor, but also a doctor in the United States, he said one coach will impact more people in one year than the average person does in a lifetime. This to me um, is something, the reason why I get up every day with a motivation and a hunger and don't hit my snooze button. We practice at 6, 6.30 in the morning. So I'm getting up at 4.30, 4.45 every morning when we have practice. Um, because I hope you guys understand that your guys' platforms are so important. And that's one thing I really want to stress home to you in the beginning is that your impact you're making, I don't care if you're coaching eight and nine-year-olds or if you're coaching pros. The platform that God's given you, the platform that you have is so important and you have such a responsibility to take it serious. I coach junior college with some of you guys like, what the heck that is? Or you might look down at it or be like, who the heck's that? But I and my husband is Gannon Baker, who is global all over the world and like the godfather of skill training in a lot of ways. And my platform, believe it or not, I truly feel is just as important as his. He coaches and teaches and impacts the world. And I might only impact 17 players, but that's just as important. So I want to encourage you to understand that the fact that you're even on here says a lot about you because you're taking it serious and you're taking a responsibility. And I feel like that's key because you have to be invested and you have to love this game and you have to love the people involved with it in order to be the best at it and to impact like you can. So if you're coaching eight and nine year olds and your goal is to coach pros, be the best where you are, be phenomenal where you are, and you'll get there one day. But start with the people that are in front of you. Because for a lot of these kids, they're hiding behind the basketball. I know, and even some coaches are hiding behind the basketball. A lot of the great players that you'll come across are the players that I get at the junior college level or even the division one level, division two level. They're hiding usually behind the ball for a reason, okay? There's something that's either an outlet or it's a distraction or it's the thing that they can trust. So understand that as a coach, you might be the only person that's constant and present to them. So you can't really afford to have a bad day, okay? Because these kids are counting on you. Um, you have to go into each relationship knowing that you're willing to be their champion. Like knowing that no matter what, you're going to do whatever it takes to help this kid or help this player get through and be better and grow and get them closer to their goals and their purpose. So that's one really big thing I want to hit home is to make sure that you understand whatever platform you're at right now, that it is important. And maybe you're not where you want to be, but where you're at right in front of you, you're exactly someone's lifeline, you're something that someone's prayed for, that someone might be depending on every single day because they don't have something constant, and you might be the only thing that speaks life in their life. So continue to do it. Um, all right, so when players leave, this is, this is um, my daughter's team, which you'll see, and then there's some of my players. It's one of our basketball games in the background. But when players leave Eastern Florida, I want to make sure that they're holistically empowered, and I'm not just talking like this sounds like a lot of fluff and a lot of, oh, okay, everyone says this, but no. And I'm going to show you the ways that we do this. I'm not just talking it. We walk it, and we believe it, and we do it. Bottom line, I don't have a national championship. I have state championship. I have conference championship. I don't have a national championship ring. I've never won yet one yet, and that is still a goal for me. But just because I haven't won a national championship does not mean that there's not things in here that you can take out of here. So I hope you are taking notes because that's the only way you're going to really remember stuff. Um, holistically, be empowered so that spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physically. We want to make sure that they're empowered in all ways. I want to equip them for life because me and you both know and all of y'all know that life is hard. Like life is hard. And one thing it is fair about it is that it's hard for everyone. And so I want to make sure when this ball stops bouncing, that they're not like, what the heck? I've been a basketball, all I am is a basketball player. That's all that matters to me. Basketball is my everything. What am I going to do now? And they're flipping out, having a midlife crisis at 25, 26, because ball's all they know. So it's really important at Eastern Florida, we show them that basketball is something they do. It is not who they are. Because when they become 25 and 30 and we're not with them every day, they're going to realize that there's more than just basketball. And there's not the same support system that they have with us at Eastern Florida. We also want to help them pick up the pieces and be healed because we all know that a lot of the things that we see in practice, and I don't know if you guys have perfect teams or perfect teams that are really like um, everyone's put together and they're all in and they're all grinding, no attitude, no body language, no laziness. Um, we have a lot of that issues every day in practice. Every team I've had um, issues with that. And those people are people who are hurting. Usually the people who are messing up or getting negative attention or having a rough day, they're hurting. So your goal as a coach is to help them heal through that. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that too, how you can help these kids heal through that process. Because instead of just assuming that this kid's a BB head or what the heck's wrong with this kid, um, you might want to go ahead and just realize that there has to be something that's going on with that kid and take the time to figure it out 
instead of just writing them off or getting frustrated with them, but maybe taking it back that your perception might be deception. Um, then we also want to build living trophies. And when we be on living trophies, like I said, I haven't won a national championship yet, but I want to build living trophies. I want these girls or these guys, I want them to be walking living trophies in life with their family as a husband, mom, wife, whatever their role is next when they leave me or they leave basketball. I want them to be an outstanding citizen and activist in their community. Um, so that's something that we try to do with Eastern Florida. Just go ahead and start that. And then obviously find their purpose and what God's made them to be. And I know some of y'all are not believers or maybe don't understand, God, I am a Christian. Um, I do believe in purpose, but it might be that you don't use the word God's purpose. Maybe you've helped them figure out their why. Like, why am I here? Why do I matter? Why am I valuable? Um, so those are things that at Eastern Florida that we really try to leave players with when they leave us. Um, so how do you motivate? Now, I'm not saying this is the only way to do it and this is the right way to do it, but this is my way of doing it. And this is a way that I feel um, is the most successful, in my opinion, through my, through my career. And you guys might look at me like I'm like some 20, I'm 38 years old. Like I said, been a head coach for 13 years. I've had a lot of success. My winning record is 80% and higher. Um, so I have had a lot of trial and error with a lot of this. And motivating out of fear is not the answer. Motivating out of love is. So now I'm not saying it's wrong because I do use fear in some ways too. I'm not perfect, but I try as much as I can to have everything come out of love. And there's people who are successful in championships and you might be one of them and good for you. And if that works for you, that's great. But in my opinion, longevity wise and holistically wise, fear is not the answer. Fear is not the answer. It's love. And we try to be hot with my program. And that's when we're humble, open and transparent. And it starts with the coaches. If what you want out of the relationship with your players and with your team, it starts with you. So if you're going to be walled up and you're not going to be open or humble or transparent, then don't expect your players to be that way if you're not gonna take the, take the time to do that. So one thing that we really try to stress in our staff is to be hot. Loving tough does not mean you're soft. And love, a lot of people hear the word love and like, oh, you're soft and you're pacifying them and you're feeling sorry for them and you're doing whatever. No, that's not what I'm talking about. Loving tough is loving them enough to know that this is gonna be the hardest thing that you're gonna do because I'm gonna push you, I'm gonna expect more out of you and I'm gonna help you achieve your dreams and go after your goals like no one's ever helped you before. And that's love and, and a lot of people, like bark like knock that off and think oh you can't love like I tell my players I love them all the time my coaches I love them I'm a hugger um and I know sometimes you can't hug your players because maybe of the gender or whatever but you can find ways to touch people if it's dapping them off if it's some secret handshake um I know I've, I have nicknames for almost all my players so they feel special um so there's different ways that you can touch your players to make them feel special every time you see them and that's going to be key as far as showing them how different ways that you can be loved. And I'm going to talk more about too, about being creative with that. Um, and with standards, we try to make, we try to set high standards for them. Um, as far as your work ethic, things that you control, your work ethic, your attitude, your energy, being a great teammate. Um, and those are things that we really try to um, kind of emphasize and we pep up and we hype up and we expect, we expect that every time they step on the court, no excuses, there's no excuses for that. Like they got to be a great teammate. Like we practice at 6 a.m. I already told y'all that. There's no, oh, I'm tired. There's no, I'm not a morning person. Like you got to bring it. And it's funny because like even if a kid's like in a bad mood or something or like they're tired, we'll literally bum rush them and do like a mosh pit to like hit, like just knock them and hit them and try to transfer energy to get them to wake up or we'll turn on some of their music or favorite music or we try to do like a fun thing, which they'll get more into just to kind of get the energy going at 6 a.m. in the morning because it is hard, but life is hard because at your job, you're expected to produce at 6 a.m. So there's no excuses for not showing up and giving your best and being able to control those things. Um, and I talked about this earlier, perception is deception. Um, make sure you guys try to really figure it out. If a kid's missing class or messing up in practice, it might not be, or it's coming across lazy. It might not be that they're lazy. It might be one, they're trying to see if you're going to bail out on them. Two, it could be that they're scared to even try or they're scared to look stupid or they don't want to fail. So really try to take the time to figure out what, where is that coming from instead of just assuming that they're lazy or they're messing up practice or what the heck's wrong with them or why are they late to practice? This is the third time. Um, or maybe their energy's off. Maybe they're not eating. Maybe they don't have food at home. So really, instead of assuming and jumping to the conclusion that your perception is the only one, really try to take the time to figure out what their perception is and what's going on there in. And then you can decide what to do from there. And then I talk about fair and equal. And I feel like this is really important as a coach because a lot of people 
are thinking that everything should be equal. And if you say that you don't have a favorite on your team, nah, there's no way. There's no way. I even told my team for the jump. I was like, I'm going to have favorites on this team. And my favorites are going to be the ones who go hard, go the extra mile, um, do an unseen hours, push, buy in, give everything they got. Those are going to be my favorites. Bottom line, you're going to be my favorite. And you all have the same opportunity to be my favorite. But here's the thing. You cannot coach every kid like they're equal. And they're not. And I know a lot of y'all probably know this, but I can't stress this enough. I heard this explained to me a couple years ago, and it really sat with me. And I'm a mom of three kids. I have a three-year-old, six-year-old, and 10-year-old. If, when we live in our backyard, we have a baseball field and we have like an eight foot fence. So how I'm gonna explain this is, there's a baseball game going on over the eight foot fence. If I wanted to be equal about it, I give every single one of my kids a two, two foot step ladder, right? And so I'm over here giving a two foot step ladder and expecting my three year old, six year old, 10 year old. Well, my 10 year old can see over this fence because she's 10 and she's taller. Well, my six year old and three year old cannot see the baseball game because I'm over here trying to be equal, no. The right thing and the fair thing to be is to give them all a ladder that makes them tall enough to look over the fence so they can all be in the same place and get the same opportunity and have the same experience and have the same opportunity to be successful as the three, six, and 10 year old by giving them different level step schools. So I'm explaining that because there is really no such, if, if you're trying to be equal with everything, it's not going to happen. It's not going to work. The only way you're going to come out of this, I feel successful, is that if you learn how to tailor and how to customize your coaching your mentorship, what you're doing, your teaching to your players based on being fair, which is getting your whole team moving in the same direction from the strongest in one point to the weakest in one point, all at the same time, trying to get to that same destination. And where does the buy-in start? Well, if you haven't figured that out, it's hard. Um, that's, that's where it starts. I mean, it starts from heart. And I know you hear the whole cliche, oh, if your players don't know if they care about you, they're not going to work hard, they're not going to care about you. Well, it's true. Um, Kevin Eastman, who's a mentor for my husband and I, um, he wrote that the investment of the heart is the investment of all champions. And that's something I feel like is really powerful because I feel like a lot of people get so stuck in the X's and O's. They get so stuck in the next defensive scheme and what's the next rebounding drill and our game planning and all that. And they forget that, man, there is actually human beings with relationships and people on my team who are struggling or Maybe we're not playing well, not because of my X's and O's. We're not playing well because of my defensive schemes. Maybe we're not playing well because they don't feel like I care about them or they have stuff going on and they need someone to be there for them. And so I, I promise you, I'm going to go over some stuff, but I promise you, if you attack the heart first and the buy-in and really try to customize and go after each player in their heart, you're going to have them, they will go through. It doesn't matter what the score is. Yeah, you could probably be better at X's and O's. If you have that whole thing and have your cake too, that's awesome. But at the end of the day, you're going to have lifelong friendships and lifelong people who are always a part of your family because they know you truly cared about them as a person, not what they could do for you, not if you can execute, not, not um, if they produce for you, not how many wins and losses you got with them, but that you care for them as a person. My first recruit was nine years ago in college. My first college recruit was nine years ago. Her name is Tika McNeil, and she just graduated with her PhD, her doctorate, um, her doctorate in med school. She just graduated with it from day one and I'm going to her coat ceremony and all that in August. And I can't tell you how much joy that brings that nine years ago, I brought in my first recruit and now she's a doctor. Like that right there is a win for me. It's not, well, what defensive scheme did I run back then? Or how many games did we win? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm one of the most competitive people you'll meet, but understand you have to, these kids have to know and you generally have to know that you care about them. You can't fake it. If you like manipulate or try to fake it, they're gonna see right through you. How are you going to love, grow, and get your players to buy in? That's a really good question. And you guys might have your own, and I'd be interested if you guys have some, some ideas for me, please feel free to email me and share me some of your ideas because I'm always trying to learn. Um, you're gonna be purposeful and intentional on your growth with your players, but honestly, with the purpose and being intentional, it's not gonna start with your team. Your purpose and your intent is gonna start with you. And I know that sounds crazy, and we're spending so much time trying to like figure out how to make the best of our team, how to make our team best, what, how can I set them up for success, what would be the best for this player, what customized skill workout can I give this player, but what are you doing for you? Because honestly, your team cannot be the best it can be unless you invest yourself. Because what you have, you have to fill yourself in order to pour out on other people. And unfortunately, I see too many coaches get burned out or so drained 
or so tired because they don't invest in themselves. And you guys can obviously read this later on, um, on your own too, if you need more time. I have my sister's cat joining us. Hi, princess. Uh -huh. um, so how are you investing in you so you can get the best from your team? So these are just some things that I've done um, and I try to do. There's prayer and devotional, practice small disciplines, read at least 15 minutes of something positive, exercise, listen to positive music, try to touch your players. Um, one thing that I really love that I got from Kevin Eastman probably two or three years ago was a Wilt journal. And I'm not sure if you guys have heard of this or not, but it's what I learned today journal. It's a Wilt journal. And I actually keep mine in my phone. And every day I try to reflect and write something about what I learned today or what went through today or something that could have made me better from today. And I actually go through it very pretty often and just go through what I've learned. It might be a quote or a scripture or what I learned from my experience with a player, but keeping a journal where you can reflect and it can even be just a gratitude journal. You don't even have to do what I learned today, but I keep a Wilt journal in my phone and I write in it all the time. And you can listen to podcasts or YouTube. You guys are on here with me right now, which is really awesome. I appreciate you being on here with me. Um, make sure you have nourishing relationships in your life, not toxic relationships, because unfortunately, toxic relationships really take from you and they drain from you, which eventually takes from your team. It takes from those other relationships who are counting on you to flow into them and to feed into them. Make sure you guys um, are open to feedback and have a powerful mentor in your life. Um, like I said, I've been a head coach most of my life. So luckily through my husband and through other coaches I met along the way, I found some really great colleagues and really great mentors. Um, but make sure you guys have someone that you can count on because the go-to person needs someone to go to. They do. Um, and then spend time in your passion, your other ventures. Spend time in different things that you're passionate about. Um, ball is life, 100% ball is life. But unfortunately, if ball is all that you have in life, then I'm not sure how fulfilled that is. I hope you have other things in life that you're passionate about outside of ball. Even if it's your family, or your dog, or you love like walking your, um, hanging out with your cat or movies. I pray that you have other passions and other outlets outside of basketball. Lead from the overflow. So this is what I was talking about earlier. I feel like it's so important. I don't know about you guys, but I have no trouble sleeping. None, no troubles at all. Um, the people that are like, man, I have trouble sleeping. I'm like, man, be a mom of three kids and coach 17 players and then come talk to me. Um, you won't have any troubles. It's like instant natural sleeping aid. Um, so with that, um, you have to make sure that throughout the day, you have so many people depending on you, your administrators, your assistant coaches, your friends, your family, your 15, 17 players that you have. So you have to really try to go above and beyond to make sure that you pour into yourself because whatever overflow you have is what you're going to have left for your players or any relationship you're in. So it's important that you really do, and I, I know I'm just like probably on repeat, you're like, oh, I already know this, but understand at the end of the day, if you are exhausted and drained, man, what a good day that is. And, and that's the thing, like I'm exhausted and drained and like flat out going to fall out every single night, but I'm really thankful for it because I'm thinking to myself, man, God used me. Obviously, I did a lot today. I, 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 I obviously went really hard or gave everything I had to this day because I literally have nothing left. But if you don't work on pouring into you the next morning, it's going to be harder and harder to get up. So make sure you really do try to find different things um, just to pour into your life. And then when you speak, understand that you literally, your tongue can speak destruction and failure. And y'all all know, y'all, I guarantee y'all have that one person in your life. It could have been a coach, a teacher, a family member who said something to you 10 to 15 years ago, and it's still with you to this day. And it was negative. It was failure. It was lying. It was something that was destructive to you that you still hold on to to this day. Understand how powerful your words are. How, so when you think of that, you have to find ways to get where you're trying to get them to go and to motivate them with speaking life, speaking love, speaking truth, but from a place of love, not a place of anger, resentment, hate, bitterness. Because I feel like a lot of times as coaches, we feel like since we are kind of the higher up or the one at the um, top, that we could treat our players or treat our people underneath us however we, we want. And that is not true. Like the respect that you show and the love that you show is usually reciprocated. If you honor and love people and respect them, they're going to give that back eventually. But if you don't, then they're going to turn away. They're not going to buy in. They're not going to listen to you. And they're not going to respect you. And they're not going to give you your all. So really pay attention because, yeah, I'm sorry does work. 
but at the same time, it's really hard to erase the words that you put into them. And when you do say words, they are seeds. And those seeds are something that you have a choice of either growing them and watering it. And yeah, y'all are gonna face crap. And when you face crap, learning a way to fertilize it and make it something that could be for good, that feels good, okay? But at the same time, if you mess up, own it. Own it. If you mess up, I messed up. Own it, learn from it, ask for forgiveness and move on. You're not perfect. And your players know you're not perfect. So instead of thinking that you want your players to make sure that they know you're perfect and that you know it all, they know that you don't. And none of us too. None of us have it together. So I just, again, want to encourage to be transparent, okay? Be real um, and come from a place of love because you do have a choice on what, how you want to feed things. You could feed death by your tongue and destroy someone because you can't take someone's soul with your words because that's how important your platform is. Or you can bring life to them and maybe attack more of the behavior rather than the person. So really pay attention to your words. Um, and I really feel like you'll, you'll harvest a lot of good fruit. I do think good wins, more wins will come out of it, but I also think that your relationships longevity wise will be great because I know a lot of coaches have a lot of wins and championships, but some of their players never, most of their players never talk to them again once they leave the court. And you guys might have some coaches that you haven't talked to in a long time because it just wasn't a good experience and you didn't feel like they brought you life. Well, don't be that coach. Like make sure that your players come back to you in five, 10 years, 15, 20 years and thank you, even though I know it's a thankless job, and maybe have you be at their wedding or show pictures of their kids, like, be that coach that even if you didn't win the championship, you'll always forever be someone that was in their corner and always spoke life to them and believed in them. This is my family. Uh, my three-year-old's on the left. That's my husband, Gannon. My six-year-old's in the middle, and our daughter, Kayana, is 10, and she, we adopted her when she was four, um, and this is my why. So I know you guys all have whys, and if you don't know your why, I pray that you start really working on your why because your why is very important of what you do, what you do. Um, so with my family, um, I start, the why is usually where I start with my team. Like I just finished up recruiting for this year, praise the Lord, because I literally had to bring in nine players. Um, and we just finished up our roster, which for junior college, we usually are recruiting nine players out and nine players in every year. Um, this is probably one of the earliest I've ever finished recruiting. So the first assignment I gave my team, I sent them a 30 minute video on their why and overcoming fear. And then they're writing their papers right now and it's due to me on Friday of what their why is um, off the court and on the court, what, what, what are their greatest fears. And they're also writing a paper on right now in that is um, something that they wanna change that they think they'll make a difference in their life. So this is where I start with my buy-in, I attack the heart and I start with each individual player trying to learn what their why is. And as a coach, I hope you know what your why is. Um, my, my why is definitely my family. I, I, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. And then if they understand their why, you have to understand that they will not give up that easily. Like once your players, I mean, Kevin Durant, I mean, if you watch Kevin Durant, I mean, he um, wore his number for his high school coach, you know, and you saw Jordan, the last dance when his dad died. I mean, he was so hungry and so emotional for his father too. If they figure out their why, why they're doing what they're why, what they're doing, what they're doing, they are less likely to give up so easily. They're more resilient. They're more empowered. They have a hunger um, to seek uh, what their why is and to motivate them on the good, bad, and ugly days because we know they're all there. Um, and then also, um, it helps with their growth too because their why is usually connected to their values, their dreams, and their purpose. So I just wanted to share my family. All right, so as a coach, this is something I hope that's really valuable to you guys because this is something that's been really valuable to me. Um, I started this thing. I don't, I change it up sometimes where sometimes it's champions, champions in the classroom or it's championships for life or daily vitamins. But I started um, about four or five years ago trying to find ways to hold myself accountable as a coach on how I can help my players just pretty much plant seeds in their life that some of them might you know, take hold of it. Some of them might literally take the seed and throw it out. Um, but eventually, hopefully one seed plants in their life. Um, but I hold myself accountable almost every day, if not every other day of daily vitamins, um, which we call these like championship, championship, um, champions for life is sometimes what we call, like I said, in the classroom. Because um, it's more than just a game. It's about championships for life. 
So our daily vitamins, every Monday at Motivational Monday. So this is something that we have guest speakers come in. We have an assist board, which I'll explain a little bit later. Um, 15 minutes at the end of the practice, we'll talk about a, like a motivational story or we'll write, read something or article. Um, we do TED Talks. We have classroom sessions with TED Talks on Mondays. Um, we watch different people's testimonies that can motivate us. We maybe have a movie night um, or watch the part of a movie. We do motivational videos. Sometimes we do projects. I'm, not, I'm sure you guys are probably all familiar with John Gordon, but like he had a one word thing that he's all about. And we did a one, we do a one word project every year where we get a big canvas and they paint their one word for the year and we put it in their lockers. Um, so motivational Mondays is a way for me just to motivate them and help them just try to like fuel into them energy and passion and just like how to overcome and how you can do um, anything if you put your mind to it. Then we have Tough Tuesdays, and this is our Testimony Tuesdays, and on Tuesdays um, is where we share testimonies. At first, they just started with them just telling like a highlight, something about themselves that was a highlight. It's one of the hardest things they had to overcome, and just like why they play basketball. Well, it's grew over the years, so probably the last six years, this has become a whole extravaganza. And since uh, we have two people that go every Tuesday, and they make a slideshow, and they literally get up in front of the team, and they tell us about their life. They show us their families, which is really cool, especially for like internationals and people from out of state. Um, they tell us their story up to the point of Eastern Florida. And it allows them to maybe, this might be the first time some of them's ever told their story. Uh, there's been a lot of stuff that's come out of people's stories that they've never, they said they've never said before, or actually confronted, which has been really amazing to watch. Um, but it's given them ownership of voicing and empowering themselves with their story. Uh, so coaches start at first, and I know it might seem a little scary, but like I said, you don't understand how powerful your story is as a coach, and these players are really looking at you thinking you have it all together. You might be married with kids and have a nice house, and they might just think that you, are the, you have never had anything you had to struggle with because you're just that tough that you just show up every practice, you have it all together, you, they, you never show your limp or your weakness, but we all know we all have them. So on, test, on Testimony Tuesdays or Tough Tuesdays, I always start with me first, and then my assistants go next, and then usually returners go next, and it goes from there. Um, and it takes some time, because like I said, we try to do two every Tuesday, um, but I feel it's really powerful, because a lot of people don't know your story, and um, most people don't know my story either. They look at me thinking I have a beautiful family, have everything together, but then once I tell my story, it's really, I think, enlightening and opens a lot of people's eyes. Like, man, she's been through all that. Wow, she's going through what I'm going. Man, she has been through some stuff. And then what you'll find is, which is really awesome, is that a lot of the players have similar stories and they start leaning on each other. Oh, I didn't know you lost your dad. Man, you lost your aunt to cancer. I lost my cousin to cancer. Oh, I'm sorry. Your best friend died in a car accident. Man, my cousin, you know, it, and so it becomes this thing where it's like, oh, this is not just this person, let's say Sally, who's in a bad mood today because it's her sister's, and we all know it's her sister's anniversary of her death. Like her sister died six years ago today. Or um, Sally over here, we know that she, she struggles because she's away from home and misses her family. She's really close to her sister. So there's different ways. And then like we've had recent players that lost family members and we have players who lost family members a while back. So they are kind of leaning on each other and supporting because I would love to talk to them about losing someone close and I've lost my grandpa, but I've never lost a mom, dad, sister, or brother. Um, so that's something that they're able to lean on each other about. And then what you'll end up finding out, and I'm telling you this because I'm taking the time to tell you this because this is so powerful. You'll find that your team ends up playing for each other, not just with each other. Once they know each other's story, it becomes this thing like, I have your back. I got you. I'm not going to let you down. Versus, oh, I'm playing with this person. Oh, man, look at her. She's got the whole world. Like, she's got everything, and she doesn't. And we all know that there's a lot of things that come up. So um, I really encourage, if you can do Testimony Tuesdays in your own way, obviously your own variation, it's life-changing. I've had players leave here and go to major Division One programs. They're like, man, coach, I wish we'd do Testimony Tuesdays because I don't know anything about my teammate except for what she eats and what music she listens to. They don't know their story. So t I, would, I would take the time. It's been really powerful on our end. And um, on Top Tuesdays, we also talk about struggles, um, handling adversity, different activities. We role play stuff, anger management. So Top Tuesdays aren't just for testimonies, but it's also for an opportunity. Um, it's funny, this cat right here. It's also for an opportunity for you guys um, to 
to uh, talk about handling tough situations. We do something where you, you, we, everyone just puts what they're struggling with anonymously in a little hat and just writes it. And then we read it out loud so that the team doesn't know who's struggling with it, but the team understands there's people on this team struggling in these areas. And just for us to try to find ways to uplift everyone. So Tough Tuesdays has been um, really great for us. Wednesdays, we have Wisdom Wednesday. Um, this is where we do talk about nutrition, relationships, money management, career exploration, anything that you can speak wisdom into people. I have an assistant coach. His name is Mark Dakotas. He's a retired sports writer. And I call him Coach Yoda because he is our wise guy. I won't say old guy, but he's a wise guy. And uh, we love him so much. But he's, one, he's a coach that's like really take a part of this. And he brings so much wisdom to us that he takes over these classroom sessions on Wednesday occasionally. Uh, so I don't know if you have coaches around you that are like really like geeked out and stoked up about all different kinds of nutrition and different things. But this is a way of preparing your players for life, not just for basketball. So this is past life. We have thankful Thursdays. Um, every Thursday we try. Like I said, there's some Thursdays that it, we might slip. But every Thursday at the end of practice or the beginning of practice, we go around and talk about what we're thankful for within our family, our basketball family, and then what they're thankful for outside of the family. Um, this is also, when we're in the classroom, we take the time, I have them write a email or text or a letter um, to someone that they're thankful for every Thursday for in the classroom. So it's just them showing their heart of gratitude. And then Fridays, we have Future Leader Fridays. And when I first started coaching, I was like, man, I'm gonna get my team captains and I'm gonna feed into them, we're gonna do breakfasts, and I'm gonna groom them and I'm gonna grow them to be these great leaders. And then it occurred to me about four or five years later that, man, why am I just putting all this effort into my captains? Like, I want to grow every single player into a leader in their own way. Now, not all of them are going to be like um, pretty much extroverted leaders that are just, you know, outspoken and lead up there. But even my introverted kids, they have ways that they can lead too. So Fridays is our future leader Friday. Um, we just work on different things to help them become leaders. Uh, the book, The Team Captains, as you see on the screen, The Team Captains Leadership Manual by Jeff Danson. That's been really helpful for us. We go through that and go through different chapters and different sections of that book on Fridays. Um, also with our captains, I don't choose captains and I don't have my players just put a name in the hat for captains. We have like a whole like different like um, kind of assessment on different characteristics or different things that we look for in a captain. And we have the players fill out three names per like question. It might be like who the coach, um, who do you think the coach has the best relationship with? Who do you trust? Who do you go to? Um, who's the hardest worker? So that's how we vote on our captains is we literally have a whole like inventory that we put together and we, we log the points and whoever's our top two or three, it becomes captain. So that might be something that you implement in your program too, if you even have captains. Um, Saturdays are spiritual Saturday, which is just me trying to do fruits of the spirit, which is forgiveness, love. Um, me trying to just trying to find ways for them to find peace, sound mind, just different things um, that I can put in front of them of hope, of love, just positive things. I know forgiveness is a big thing that a lot of us struggle with um, because we can't really get over our pride or get over the fact that forgiving them is not for other people, but it's for yourself. So that's something we do focus a lot on on Saturdays. And then Sundays is sleepy Sundays because they're tired of seeing me and tired of hearing on me. So they don't hear from me on Sundays. So I hope you guys can like take something out of that daily vitamins. Obviously you can change it and alter it to be something that's more for you or something that you would love to do. Um, another thing we really work on and focus on is who are they? Um, we want them to help them to discover who they are, fall in love with themselves and commit to it because really what they think of themselves and how they love themselves is pretty much the output you're going to see and how they're going to treat people or treat their life. Um, we are big in Enneagrams. I'm not sure if you heard of that, but I would strongly suggest doing Enneagram. There's a lot of free Enneagram tests out there with your team. It's going to tell you a lot about them and it's going to help that person also understand a lot about themselves, like what they look like when they're not, when they're stressed out, when they're in a growth mode, when they're good, how they handle things. So Enneagrams, I feel like are really, really helpful. Um, also how they learn, we usually attacked how they learn the beginning of the semester so that they're set up for success because I think it's important for each person to understand how they best learn. And there's obviously inventories on that. Love languages have been mind blowing and breakthrough for me. Uh, probably about 10 or 12 years ago, I came across the book, The Five Love Languages, which I'm not sure if you heard of it or not, but it's mind blowing. And it's pretty much showing you and telling you how people want to be loved. So we do this assessment early because it's really important for me that I love people how they want to be loved. For instance, Gannon Baker is my husband. 
he is a words of affirmation person. I'm a quality time person. At the beginning of our relationship, we had a lot of issues because I'm over here like, put your phone away, spend time with me, put your phone away, spend time with me. And he's over here like, hey, how was my coaching camp? How was my camp? How was my seminar? How do I look? I just worked out. And I'm over here, I'm over here like, the whole world tells you how amazing you are all the time. Why are you asking me for words? Spend time with me. Um, so once I realized the five languages of love, and there you see them, it's physical touch, words of affirmation, gift giving, quality time, and acts of service. When I realized how important it is to learn each person's love language, it's been phenomenal for me. And sometimes those love languages are hard for you to love like that because that's not your love language. But it's important for you to understand that's how they want to be loved and that's how you fill them up. So I would strongly suggest reading the five love languages of five lang love languages of love, or at least do more research on it. And then we try to help them with their gifts and strengths and different weaknesses. And then again, help them fall in love with themselves. Teach players to own their life. We're really huge on control because I feel like if you show players what they can control and how their past does not define their present or their future, then they can kind of let go of the past, learn from it and move on. If you continue to like make excuses or you're a person that blames things or make excuses or points here, points there, or you're finding things for them to blame. Oh yeah, your mom, your dad. Oh man, here, yeah, your friend. Oh, your teacher, your professor. Like we don't, we don't do any of that. Like it is so important for us that if you mess up, it's your fault. You have control of that, 100% control of that. Um, and I take the same, the same mentality of it. And we really try to stress to our players how important it is for you to learn how to take control of your life and understand that you can control it. Stop, knowing it, stop giving the control to everyone else because then it makes that this life isn't yours. So us going after them and not blaming others, we're really big on not being an energy vampire because you can control your energy. When you come into a room, don't be a thermometer where whatever the room temperature is, that's what you are, but come in there and be a thermostat and you can set the temperature and set the tone. Um, and, and that is important no matter what field you're in or what, what you do as a coach and a player. And that's as much important for us. I, I mean, we all have our days, but you cannot afford to go into practice and have bad days. You can't. You can't. You have too many people relying on you. So don't go in there with the whole, oh, my team's dead. Oh, they have no energy. Or go in there boring because that's what they're feeding off. Even in games, when, when I see coaches quit and just sit down and stop coaching, it drives me nuts. Because I'm over here like, your team is feeding off of you and you're giving in as a thermometer, like be a thermostat. Even if you lose this game, lose the game how you want to lose. Don't lose your game sitting down. Or if you sit down naturally, good for you. I don't really sit down, but if you sit down naturally, that's awesome. But keep coaching them up. Do not quit on them. Um, and then with worth ethic and attitude, those are all things that they control. Being a good teammate, um, servant leader, and that perception and um, reaction are big things that we try to teach with control. And then Michael Jordan, the last dance, like I said, again, to my Aussies, if you did not get to see it because of the time or whatever it may be, or Americans, check it out on YouTube. Um, I know they've already have it on YouTube, but he talked about how he missed 9,000 shots in his career, almost 300 games, 26 times. I've been trusted to take the game winning shot and missed. I failed over and over again, and that's why I'm successful. So another really big thing with us with getting your players to buy in into your culture and who you are is allowing them to be okay and be comfortable and making mistakes and failing. Teach them to embrace failure and be mistake driven. A lot of times we go into this thinking that the only way um, that the only way to be successful is if you don't fail and you fake it for everyone to think that you've never failed. This is not boxing. You're not going to go into a match 33 and 0, 35 and 0. This is not how the world works. It's more like UFC where you're going to go into it and you're going to get hit. You're going to fail. You're going to be laying on your back, looking up to the ground, looking up to the sky, trying to figure out what to do next. But how are you going to handle it? How are you going to react? Um, so life is, like I said, a boxing match. Players who don't give their all or are scared to fail are most likely have more going on than that. So make sure you research and you try to like find ways to figure out what they're afraid of or what's holding them back. You have to encourage failure and be uncomfortable. And that even goes with yourself. If you mess up, be open about it. Talk about it. Be upfront about it. Um, and then encourage that no mistakes, no mistakes, they're just lessons. Uh, there's nothing like a player making a mistake and you obviously correcting it. Um, you're trying to, you know, maybe put your arm around them and like bring them along and talk to them. Uh, they didn't mean to mess up. So instead of yelling at them, like, why are you messing a layup? Or what the hell are you doing? No, I find myself saying, what the hell are you doing a lot? Um, instead, of finding, instead of doing that, 
maybe you need to more try to, and I'm trying to do this as well. Trust me, I'm not perfect, but try to attack the actual behavior of what they can do differently. Like, hey, next time get it higher off the glass. Or I'm not sure what you're doing, but we're running this. Um, so make sure you understand or you're communicating with me so we, we don't have that miscommunication again. On, and another thing that I'm really trying to do as a coach and I've been trying to do is to find your players doing stuff right. Okay, because sometimes it's easy for us to see wrong and see everything they're doing wrong, but also to really try to encourage and find players doing what you're looking for right and pump those players up so other players want to come along instead of just tearing down or criticizing or highlighting the players that are doing wrong all the time. Um, make sure with it that you and your team are really focusing on becoming better out of things instead of getting being better. And this is a lot of growth as far as mentally um, as a coach and player. Uh, so really try to turn things into a lesson and being better. Let's get better, not bitter. Um, and okay, yeah, you missed the free throw to win the game. All right, let's get better from this. It's, there's a reason why that happened. Let's turn this, the, turn this crap into fertilizer. And let's grow. Let's get better. And let's work on our free throws. Um, it could be as easy as that. But how you talk to them and your perspective is going to make a big difference. Um, investment outside and off the court. So we do, try and check on time. We do a lot of uh, different things. We, um, we try to do like different meals, like breakfast or lunch on campus and just meet up with our players for meetings. I know some people in the past, I haven't been able to do this before, um, but it suggests to me, I think it's a great idea. Like if someone's birthday is on the fourth, you meet with that player the fourth of every month. So it kind of holds you accountable to meet with your players. Uh, we do a lot of film study. Um, players come to my film a lot. Uh, rebound for your players. I think that's a great way outside of practice. Find ways to rebound from them and don't talk. Just listen because a lot of times they vent and they say stuff while you're rebounding. Uh, finding that intimate time with them where you're feeding into them. We do a lot of individual and small groups. If I didn't focus on skill development, if that wasn't important to me, again, it would probably divorce me. So understand that's definitely a priority in my, in my program. Uh, we focus a lot on unseen hours. I don't know what you guys do about like the extra, but we have like this huge board and we call it the extra mile board and we have our players name on it and in the days of the week and they log in their extra miles and extra things that they do every single day. If it's weights, if it's playing one-on-one, -on -one, if it's shots and all that. And it becomes really competitive um, for the people who are competitive because they want to out beat like, oh, she made 200 shots. Oh, I got to make 300 shots. But then also for my players who are kind of sandbagging it or maybe not playing very much or not getting any better, then I can look at their extra mile board and be like, look, you know, look, T, like this is the situation. You haven't done any extra. You can't expect, oh, you're in a shooting slump. Oh, well, look, you haven't done extra. So it's a kind of a way for me to hold them accountable and for them to kind of have some internalized, have some accountability within themselves too. So we just have a big white race board that we have in our locker room for them to log extra mile stuff. Um, and then extra conditioning. I know I've had some players who have to get in better shape. So I'll do extra conditioning with them. I have a really bum knee and need a knee replacement, but I'll still get on elliptical or a spin bike while they're doing the treadmill or doing something. So just spending time with them and them getting better, not just like seeming like it's a punishment and they're in it alone. So definitely find ways that you can be with them in that experience. Um, and then taking them to counseling or physical therapy, just make sure you're available for them. There's different ways to cultivate buy-in, and I talked about love and going after the heart, but we're really big on agape love, and I'm not sure if you've heard of that word before, but um, I'll go over it. And then trust, believe, nurture relationships, engage them, be creative, positive, and find joy in the little things. Um, agape love is pretty much just unconditional. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to kind of speed this up a little bit. Um, and I'm not sure, Jared, if we have questions coming in or not, but if you need to stop me at any point in time, feel free. I probably have, like, four more slides. I'm going to try to zoom through, but if not, I can stop. Uh, no, you feel free to finish up, Coach, and then we'll ask the questions when you're done. Okay. All right. So agape love is something that is, self is selfless, sacrificial, unconditioning. It's no, no un unconditional, no matter what. I'm here for you. Um, and it's important that the coaches that you have around you, like my assistant coaches and the team and the people that I bring in, that I'm willing to lose with them. Um, I don't know if you have people in your life that make you miserable or like just the worst people to lose with, but I'm sure we all do. Um, but it's really important to me that I, I'm willing to go through anything with the people that are on my team. So um, that's all at love. We're all on the same page. Um, make sure you love what you do and you share that passion. Don't seem like your life's miserable every time you come to practice. Um, if you love this game, give it everything you have. If you don't, then get out. Um, I mean, you're, you're, you're taking the advantage of something 
that is so sacred and you have such a responsibility and you can make so much impact and you're losing out opportunity if you're not giving your all and bringing passion every single day. And it, it might not be you know it all, but if you bring passion and love, that goes so far. It goes so far, I promise you it will. Um, and you need to know who they are, how to love them, what motivates them, which you just talked about. Um, listen, respect their differences. You have to be a good listener. It can't just be you talking all the time. You have to listen. That's something I've had to really love work on um, through the years is just to be a good listener and just shut up sometimes and just listen to my team or listen to my players and see what they have and then go from there. Um, and then understand that there's going to be differences and be honest and show value through it. Um, and uh, Phil Jackson said, good teams become great ones when the members trust each other enough to surrender me over we. And trust, I really feel, is like a glue to any program or to anything. Um, you have to, but the thing about trust, it's not like love. It's not unconditional. It's something that you have to earn. So make sure you speak the truth, walk the truth, and live the truth because, honestly, players can see right through you. So if you're not doing it, if you're saying one thing and doing another thing, then don't expect your players to do that. And I'm not trying because I know I need to be in better shape and I, I can probably eat healthier. And I know we did a new, like my advice. I don't do coffee or alcohol or anything, but my advice is diet. And so last year and the year before, we did like this whole nutrition thing of things that we're going to cut out and like we really try to commit it to it. And I had to give up diet. Um, now, the, the thing was that I was allowed to have a diet Coke on every game day just to keep my sanity. Um, but throughout the rest of the uh, days, I couldn't drink Diet Coke. And I can't tell you um, how much discipline and how much suffering in some ways. But I did it with my team. So you can't expect your team to do certain things where you're asking them to do, oh, extra conditioning, eat right, and drink right, and sleep right, and um, drink lots of water if you're not doing it yourself. If you're telling your team this, but like they don't ever see you drink water, or if you're asking them to eat healthy and they see you eat big whoppers for uh, I think you guys call them Maccas. You guys call them McDonald's Maccas. It's so cute. Um, call McDonald's Maccas. But if you're eating Big Whoppers or double cheeseburgers every single day and you're asking your players to be, um, to be healthy, I mean, that's double standard. So if you're going, what you're asking of your team, make sure that it's something that you're willing to ask from yourself. You're going to mess up. You aren't perfect. You talked about this earlier. Don't be afraid to mess up. Like, don't be afraid to own it and just like, hey, all I messed up. And there's nothing wrong with that. And they're going to appreciate that more instead of you acting like you did nothing wrong or uh, just looking past it because they see that. Um, I tell my team all the time, I am available 22 hours of the day. Anything you need. Um, you need me to take you to the doctor. You need me to be your counselor. You want to vent about your boyfriend breaking up with you or um, you need help with this or like, you want me to read a paper here. Like I am, I am, you need a late night call because something happened between you and your mom. I am here for you 22 hours of the day, but for two hours in the day, when we step on that court, I can't care about you. I have to care about this team. And that is something that is so powerful for me because I had so much guilt and there's been, there was one year in particular that I pacified my team and I created a very weak and soft culture because I was so worried about the players, what was going on off the court, that I changed the way I treated them and attacked them and held them accountable on the court. And our season did suffer because of that. So I strongly encourage that you let your team know, like I am here 22 hours a day. And obviously if you need more boundaries than that, then put your boundaries up however you want. That's just my, how I attack it. But two hours of the day, this team has to come over you and you have to leave that stuff off the court. Like this is all of our sanctuary. This is our place where we come together and we grind it out. So um, that's been a really helpful um, way of me communicating to my team of how important it is that off the court, I got you, but on the court, it needs to be about the team, not about you. Um, touch holistically. Like I said, you can do like fist bumps. You can um, speak into them. They just lost their grandma. Speak into them um, if they're going through a hard time because um, they're, they don't understand why this happened or something tragic happened and bad things happen to good people all the time. But you finding ways to holistically touch them every day. If it's rebounding for them, if it's dapping them off, if it's asking about their day. And I stopped, I kind of went away from how are you to what was the best part, what was the best thing about your day? Or, hey, what was the hardest thing you had to do today? Or did anything, what, what was the most interesting thing about your day? I try to try to get away from the answers of good, okay, yeah, um, I'm all right. Like, I try to ask more specific questions where they have to give me more. Um, so just finding time that you can really um, just touch your players every day in some way. And your staff, too. I mean, don't forget about your assistants and, um, and important to feed into them, too. I believe in you. That's four of the most powerful words that you can say to someone. 
Um, and these words are life-giving. They tell the person that they matter, that they have value, and that they're needed in this world. Um, so belief is so important. And these are different ways that um, we show belief because believe it or not, like how much you believe in your players matters a lot. But if you don't help these young men and women understand how they can believe in themselves and what they're capable of and what's possible for them, your belief doesn't matter. And at the end of the day, their belief is only gonna be to the extent of what they believe. So they're never gonna out achieve their belief. So if they believe they suck, they're not gonna be better than sucking, period. So it's really important that yes, you have to believe in them and they have to know that. But at the end of the day, you have to start with them believing themselves and helping them find ways to love themselves, find their gifts and figure out how to, um, how to use those gifts and where they matter and what their purpose is. Um, the next one, everyone has successes and we kind of talked about this. So we need to make sure we feed it water, fertilize the crap, use it for good, um, build them up by co co catching them to do right. Um, not always criticizing or putting them down. Um, I have to find myself, my biggest feedback from my players is that they, nothing's ever good enough because once they do one thing, I have another thing I'm trying to get them to do. And uh, they feel like that I don't sit in that moment with them and really appreciate it. So I have to do, and I've been working on it, a better job of uh, kind of celebrating and sitting in that success versus moving on. Like this year we were 23 and seven. And um, one of my players, I think we were 22 and six at the time. And one of my players was like, coach, I swear we're six and 22 right now. <laughs> like that's how they felt. Uh, and it's just like, man, you're right. Like I have to sit there and appreciate the moments and let you guys know I believe in you and I appreciate where we are. But obviously, I'm not satisfied because how we win is more important to me than actually winning sometimes. So that's something that I've had to compromise on. Um, set them up for little successes, the end of practices, try to find different drills, different things, or in, uh, individuals find different ways for them to find their confidence and see success. Um, remind them how far they've come. We had one player who was in a shooter slump, and we put a highlight reel together, and we had her write, watch it every day of just how awesome and how amazing she is as a shooter, and it really helped. Or even if you have players who are struggling with something off the court, just remind them how far they've come, what they've overcome to that point. Because sometimes we end up forgetting um, how much we've overcome and how we have everything it takes inside of us to get through it. Um, study, grind, hustle, earn it. The whole wit mentality, um, whatever it takes mentality. Um, that's something that's really important to implement with your team as well. Um, and then educate on self-talk. Um, I'm not sure about you guys, but I know I catch myself doing it all the time. Just my six-year-old does it all the time, just negative self-talk. You really have to help your players learn how to either talk over themselves, be their biggest fan, not their critic, um, catch them, maybe even ask them like, what were you thinking to yourself? What were you saying to yourself when you missed that free throw? I'm um, really digging deep in because you have to understand and they have to understand that in order for them to change, it comes with their head and their thoughts. And how their head and thoughts come out are usually through their self-talk, which does have to do a big deal with how they perform because 80% of the game is mental and 20% is um, physical. So being able to attack their self-talk and give them tools and different things, there's a whole bunch of stuff online for you to research on how different tools and different stuff you can do um, to attack their self-talk where that they can believe in themselves better. Um, engage your team. I think it's really important that you find ways to give your team feedback but um, also let them be a part of it. This is not your team. It's not my team. It's their team. And like it or not, I know some of us are like, oh, yeah, I got the whistle. And this is my team. Watch how much you're going to run. You're going to run until I get tired looking at you run. Um, that's one of my favorite, uh, <laughs> favorite sound bites. Um, but that's not true. I mean, this isn't our team. And at the end of the day, if you can find a way for your team to own the team, then it's going to come so far. Um, and how do you do that? You give them a voice. If it's in a timeout, I've had players talk in the timeout. At halftime, I've had players give feedback. Um, in practices, you can have players' choice where they get to come up with their own drills in, in the practice, and they can kind of create their own practice plan. Um, you can have it where they have different boards. Like I have, like, oh, these couple players figure out where we're eating on our next trip, or these couple players are passionate about fashion and gear, which you know what players they are because they're always asking, what gear we got coming in? What shoes? What shoes you pick out, coach? Um, maybe have those players go with you and uh, go through the magazines and help pick out your gear. But find different ways where you can kind of release some of that control and let your team kind of own it. So it's not just a, like a dictatorship. It's more of a democracy. But trust me, there's things that there's no way I'll let my team touch. But they don't know it because I try really hard to make sure that they have enough saying. So when stuff really is important to me, 
that they're okay with me having that control and they respect it because I am part of the family, but it's their family, not my family. So make sure you guys try to establish that. And I know some of you guys probably do this, but at the beginning of the year, we establish standards. And then toward, right before season starts, we, got, we kind of go over goals. Once we kind of figure out our team and they're around each other enough, we discuss identity with our team, our mission, um, and kind of the way we want to play. Because I like playing fast and running the floor and pushing it and just out toughing people and out working people. But if my team doesn't, doesn't buy into that or understand why we're doing all these conditioning or full court drills and all that, then, then we're not going to be able to really play to the full extent that I want to play. So make sure that your team does have some say or you have them be convicted with you on your guys' mission and how you guys are going to play. Uh, be creative and have fun. This is like the biggest thing. Um, as you see this picture, this is Warrior Wednesday. So for seven weeks in preseason, we have seven weeks of preseason. Every Wednesday, we did a different sport. We split the teams in two teams, and there were those two teams the whole seven weeks. And we did kickball, we did um, ultimate frisbee, we did volleyball, we did a punk kick spike um, with football. We did seven different sports, we did relays, we did seven different sports at seven weeks, and then we had the ultimate warriors at the end. And um, we, we, we just got some fruit, the favorite fruit for that, or favorite candy for that group. Um, but it's, it's so much fun and it changes up things. We're still doing things, like you'd be surprised how much and ultimate frisbee and some of these sports, how much different things and movements you're doing with basketball. Don't be afraid to step off the court and play dodgeball or do some fun stuff to kind of to kind of unstale things a little bit. And it's funny because a lot of players have never played a lot of these sports. So it, it, it's fun to see them explore new sports, but also it's it's exciting to see the competitive juice and you learn a lot about people and how they handle new stuff and adversity and competitiveness um, because it's you're putting them in a realm that might be a little bit uncomfortable for them. Um, so don't be afraid to do something like Warrior Wednesdays. Uh, put wrinkles in workouts, player's choice, end of practice. Oh, if you make a half court shot, we end practice right now. Or every half court shot you hit at the beginning of practice is 15 minutes off of practice. Um, thinking outside of the box drills. There's drills where like you could play pickup and have two basketballs going at the same time. So literally a team could be playing offense and defense at the same time. So you put all your players, I have 17 players, I'm gonna have six players, uh, say, let's say eight players on one team, nine players on the other team, or uh, whatever that is, nine and eight, nine, nine players on one team, eight players on the other team, or have eight and eight going against each other. You put two balls, and they literally play pickup with two balls. So they have to be paying attention to what's going on. Or you can have like everyone having a ball, one ball, and then you throw a second ball in there so that everyone has a ball, and then you have a game ball, and you're literally dribbling nonstop playing pickup full court with everyone dribbling the whole time with that second ball being the ball that you can shoot with. I mean, there's so many different like fun drills out there. Don't be afraid to like mix things up. And what they don't know is they're working on ball handling that whole time and they just don't know it. And they're out there laughing and having fun. We do like duct tape, two different colored duct tapes on the back of people's um, jerseys and they run around and they play tag by trying to pull off the duct tape and that's a conditioning one. And weights, you can get like a deck of cards and like have each, uh, partner them up and have each um, deck of cards where they actually like pull and then like say hearts are push-ups, spades are pull-ups, and you can have different exercises for each suit and whatever team gets to the deck of cards wins. I mean there's so many different things that you can research out there but don't be afraid to be creative and have fun outside of the typical X's and O's and just rebounding drills and defense and stuff that you do. Um, you can change up warm-up like I said, um, duct tape relays, Warrior Wednesdays, um, and then the last thing I'm kind of going to go over is being positive. That's the biggest thing. We talked about this. We have assist cups in my office, and it's literally like little Gatorade cups that I pinned, like with the tack, onto um, a like tack wall, and have I drew like papers that look like a backboard with the little um, Gatorade cups, and then we call them the assist board. It has each player's name on the um, each backboard. And players come in my office all the time and they write little assists and they put it in each little Gatorade cup. Um, so different ways of depositing some kind of life in them. And some, some people are funny, so, but it's a way that they, and you could tell the people who are words of affirmation because they're always coming to your office to check their assist cup. And you could tell the ones that aren't because the assist cup is overflowing. So finding different ways, we have Fab Five stats where we keep stats and there's stuff that's important to you that you stat it. And then at the end of practice, we have we have different point systems. And if you want our Fab Five sheet, just hit me up and I can send it to you. And whoever's the top five, they made the Fab Five and we pumped them up. And it could be like, say, charges are important to you. That could be five points. 
Offensive rebounds might be important to you. That could be worth five points. You could do different things that are important to you that you're emphasizing. And then at the end of practice, you're like, oh, this is my fab five. And um, from there, you can go and um, talk about in the next day, those girls or those guys are the white jerseys. And it's kind of like, oh, I want to make that fab five. I want to make that fab five. Um, and every day, you have a lot of players really striving for that fab five. Uh, make sure at the end of practice, you're kind of setting up for success. Uh, this is something we're doing this year. We're going to start journaling at the end of practice of five things. Each player is going to have a journal of five things they did well. What's one thing that they want to get better at? And one, one thing that they learned from each practice. We're going to try to do it every practice, if not every other practice. But I think it's important for us to journal and just end on a positive just for help them reflect and process the practice. Um, conditioning. Trying, like I said, we like to run. I'm not sure your guys' style, but we love to run. And obviously, I love my Australians because I feel like you guys like to run. You guys play very positionless basketball. So we try to make um, conditioning not a punishment. Uh, we do stuff that's like a gut check where um, you start on the line and you run and you sprint. And whoever's last in that sprint goes to the side and they're out and they start clapping for you. Then you do another sprint. The next person's out, goes to the side and claps. And you keep going till there's one person left. And like that person left feels like, whoa like I gut check this and and really at the end of the day you just have them run a whole bunch of switch sprints for competition and had someone be really proud of being the last one standing which is most likely your most in shape player um which makes other people strive to push um we also have sometimes we do where the winner runs I know a lot of times we like to make losers run but at the end of the day the players who usually win most of your drills are the ones that are going to play so don't you want them to be in better shape than maybe the ones that aren't playing as much. So um, you could kind of change the mentality and practice of like, oh, today winners are gonna uh, run because those are the people that are gonna be on the court this week because you're winning drills and you're going hard. So maybe have the mentality of switching that up. Um, just make, make getting better and make it fun. Like, don't be afraid to be a kid again and uh, share kid games and have different things that are important to you. Um, this is my last slide, but at the end of the day, I hope you guys understand that all that really matters in this is these kids and your relationships and, and the life that you give to them and what they do with what they learn from you after this, the wins and losses and the X and O's, none of that matters if they don't know that you love them and they're not going to buy in and they're not going to truly give their best and be all that they can be if they don't know that you have their back and that you love them no matter what.